No, you're fine. Thank you. I have a few technical difficulties tonight. Sorry, folks. Anyone else would like to come up in the room and then I'll go online in the room to make any public comment? All right, I'm going to go online and ask folks online, is there anyone online that would like to make public comment this evening? And you can feel free to raise your hand on the Zoom or come off mute and say your name. I wish to just clarify, um, because when I got kicked out of the meeting, I think there was a time where they couldn't hear us. We might wish to okay. clarify that folks can comment on the schedule. Public. Okay. okay, so I'm going to I'm going to restate that because I know some folks online lost audio potentially for a few minutes. So we are doing general public comment. This public comment is for items that are not on the agenda. Also, I'm opening public comment for the items that are listed on the agenda as a scheduled public comment. So if you were coming to talk about one of those things, you can make that comment now. Anyone online? You can feel free to come off mute and say your name or raise your hand. I wanna give it just a minute because we had a little difficulty there. Mm -hmm. So, um, hi, this is Joanne Vassallo, and I do live in the county, um, but I have some contributions to uh, the city that I'd like to bring up. And it is um, regarding a scheduled event, so or is something scheduled on the agenda. So I'm wondering, will we have uh, time after that to make com public comment? Joanne, if you were, um, if if it's about the It's My Land LLC on scheduled public comment, if that's what you were hoping to, to discuss, you can do that now. Okay, thank you. Um, You're welcome. I, I wanted to bring to the city's attention um, a lot of um, conversations and discussions I've had in just, I would say, over the last six months that there are a lot of assets in the people who live in the county for the city. Most of the people who I speak to, every person I've ever spoken to, we love Livingston. And there are contributions that range from, um, if there's a career event, people who are in uh, different positions who would like to be involved in that live in the county and um, can bring information about jobs that are high paying hybrid jobs that then can uh, contribute to the constituents in the city and the people who live there, their ability to buy housing. Um, that's one uh, type of contribution of the people in the county. Um, people in the county who love to come into town for restaurants, for shopping, um, I, I'll tell you, a lot of people I talk to, they laugh at the idea of going into Bozeman. They have no reason to go into Bozeman. And so those are assets that are brought into the county. So I know there's discussion about people in the county using um, city assets, but there is the other side of it that I think is an untapped resource for the city. And that is how the people in the county uh, like to and do contribute to the city and would probably do more of that if it were um, general uh, public events. Um, some of the ideas that came up is a major annual horse auction um, and uh, extreme Mustang makeover. I know many of you may have heard of that. Well, it happens annually in other towns around the US could happen here. And so um, if there is a way for the city to consider how to bring in um, those types of contributions, um, you know, I for one would volunteer and uh, I can see the city of Livingston being more like an emerald city that that infill is, um, it, you know, it's not based on development out, but it's based on use of the untapped 
um, properties or real estate or square footage and untapped ability to bring business into this beautiful historical town where a lot of people don't necessarily want to see something like has occurred in Missoula or Great Falls where you have these two different parts of town. Um, people may not even go into the historical part anymore, let alone um, help it thrive. So there's a whole conversation there that I, I just wanted to bring up for consideration and anything that the city would like to invite in that regard. Thank you, Joanne. My anyone, else, anyone else like to make public comment? Yeah, my name is David Lewis and I live in the county in the ETJ and we've made it very clear in meetings with um, Grant and others that we don't desire the city to annex our property or basically any properties without the permission of the landowner in the uh, donut area. We and many of us um, have water rights from the Livingston Ditch and we use those on our properties for growing food in our case and others use it for livestock and animals and stuff. So we're very concerned about this and we've come together and created the It's My Land LLC and we're, we, we feel that we can collaborate in harmony and with peace with the city, yet we feel some trepidation as to what uh, the city may do based on what the previous city manager was doing. And, and so you can understand that we came here, we purposely live in the county in order to, to take advantage of what the county offers rather than having to pay the extra taxes and the SIDS from the city. So in our case, we have 15 inches of water rights from the Livingston Ditch. We grow food, we provide food for Campione, the health food store, uh, Woods Rose Market and the Farmer's Market. And can you imagine us trying to uh, grow food with city water? It, it's not as good water and it just wouldn't work. So we do not desire to be annexed and we just would like to make it very clear. Uh, water ha has been and will continue to be a major issue in the United States and the world. Bozeman, as some of you know, is having problems with water. We recently talked to an owner of the Lewis and Clark Hotel, and Bozeman has approved something like 16 new hotels, which is a hum humongous amount of water, while 11, excuse me, 11 hotels, while, while also mandating that the citizens, you know, ration their use of water on their own properties. So water is a, is a big issue for Livingston because I've been here 38 years, some of you have not lived here that long. And the pollution, the toxic plume underneath Livingston has been a huge issue in the past. And I'm very concerned. I, I totally support the, uh, you know, today's the last day to vote for the, the rec center. I, I worked right near there. And what's what you, uh, LR, LR, uh, LRC. And many of my friends got, um, had health issues from drinking the water right from Livingston at that time, that was 20 years ago. I'm very concerned that, that um, you're not listening to people who are warning you about the potential toxicity and the property that where you desire to build that. And I know that Grant's addressed this somewhat. However, uh, I think you should get a second and even a third opinion. And I know it's kind of late to bring this up because the election, the uh, Voting is ending today. I, I ask you again, as one who's very concerned about health, to look at this because can you see the irony of building a health and recreation center and yet the very soil underneath it could be so toxic uh, down in the, in the, you know, the reservoir, the uh, underground reservoirs that um, that could have an impact on people's health. So um, I don't always trust the, Montana DEQ from things that have happened in the past. I think we need to be very, very careful in this regard. And, and if the city is involved in this, which you are, I caution you to be 
extremely careful and, and how that will play out because I can see lawsuits down the road that you will not, you not, okay, I'm sorry, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comments online? All right, we're gonna go ahead and close public comment and we'll move on down the agenda. Commissioners, consent items. Ooh, pick me, pick me, I'll make a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve consent items A through C. Thank you, do you have a second? Second. I have a motion by Newts and a second by Lyons. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to, we have one proclamation this evening. Get to the right page of my agenda. And this proclamation um, is about World Theater Day. And I can see I have a whole contingent of theater folks in the back. And I wondered if you'd be so kind to stand up if you'd like while I read this proclamation. Yay, beautiful. <laughs> All right. Proclamation of, this, of the Livingston City Commission declaring March 27th, 2024, World Theater Day in the city of Livingston. Whereas World Theater Day is celebrated every year on March 27th as designated by the internal, or excuse me, the International Theater Institute in 1961. And whereas World Theater Day honors the essence, beauty, and importance of theater arts, highlighting their vital role in entertainment and the symbolic impact on life, and whereas World Theater Day serves to enlighten governments, politicians, institutions, and stakeholders globally about the value of theater to society and its potential for fostering economic growth. And whereas World Theater Day provides an occasion to rejoice in the performing arts, reminding us of theater's profound, profound contribution in, in understanding human relationships and encouraging peace and cultural diversity worldwide. And now therefore, be it resolved on behalf of the Livingston City Commission, I, Carrie Kale, Chair, do hereby declare March 27th, 2024 to be World Theater Day in Livingston, Montana. Further, I urge community members to engage in various activities celebrating theater, including attending performances at the Blue Slipper or the Shane Lalani Center for the Arts, as well as supporting local theater initiatives throughout the year. Let us collectively embrace and celebrate the transformative power of the theater in our community, fostering cre creativity, empathy, and cultural appreciation. Thank you. Can you say something? Yes, please. I just also want to shout out what wasn't on the list, which is Ranger Voices. And I know we have former coach Vicki here and some of her team, the drama team, um, who many of you go to state every year. Good job and represent Livingston really well, and you're super brave and the bravest, and that wasn't in the proclamation. I'm glad you guys could be here. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, without the arts, STEM is kind of boring and math-driven, but <laughs> STEM turns into STEAM with the, when you add arts to it, and uh, it, is a, it is definitely a, uh, a critical part of the keystone of a, a good education and a good life well lived, so thank you very much. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for coming this evening. We're excited to see all the shows that come rolling out all the time. So we appreciate that. All right, we're gonna move on. Scheduled public comments. And our first scheduled public comment tonight is the Park County Housing Coalition. Grant, do you have anything to intro with at all or on this one? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I would uh, I, I'd introduce Catherine Daly, who is um, the, the housing program coordinator for the Park County Housing Coalition. And uh, as you know, commissioners, that position is partially funded through the City of Livingston's FY24 uh, general fund budget. And um, so this is a, a bit of a report, not just on the, the, the work that um, BCHC has done and intends to do, but also a little bit of a, a progress report on, on some of the work that, that you folks have uh, funded through the budget this year. So I'll turn it over to Catherine. Great. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Grant, and uh, good evening, commissioners. 
Thank you so much for having me here today to share a little bit about the work that the Park County Housing Coalition has been doing. Um, so I have a slide presentation um, that you should have also received in your packet, so you can follow along there. Um, and folks online should hopefully be able to see the slides as well. I'll just wait until we're all ready. We're ready? Okay, great. So um, I left the March 1st date on this presentation intentionally. This was a presentation I sent out to the Park County Housing Coalition 300 some email subscribers and nearly 100 members on that date. And so I just want everyone to be aware that this is a presentation that I shared with our membership that I'm bringing to all of you just to keep you in the loop as we move forward with our work this year. So next slide, please. Thank you. So um, as Grant said, I'm Catherine Daly. I'm the Park County Housing Coalition Program Manager, and I'll be covering three topics in this presentation. And First is just a little bit of background on the coalition. And then second, I'll touch on briefly what's happening in Park County's housing market. Um, I've gotten some feedback recently that wondered whether we had conducted a whole new needs assessment. And no, we just went back and looked at a couple key data points. So no, we're not doing more studies. We're moving forward with our work. And then third, I'll review this year's work plan and specifically those programs that we've developed around our three priority tools from the Housing Action Plan, and those are accessory dwelling units, employer-assisted housing partnerships, and zoning reform. Next slide, please. So uh, the coalition is a program that's currently being incubated within uh, the HRDC's Community Development Department, but we're supported by a host of wonderful community partners, including the City of Livingston, the Park County Community Foundation, Montana State University Extension, the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, Livingston Healthcare has joined us um, now. Uh, Opportunity Bank is working on a grant with us, which we hope to receive news on this the end of this week. We have a lot of wonderful partners. Um, our mission briefly is just to increase opportunities for Park County residents to access housing where we can afford to live and thrive. Next slide, please. I like to think about our work in terms of two phases. Um, phase one was focused on research and planning and took place from roughly 2020 to mid 2023. 2020 was the year the coalition was reconvened in response to broadening interest in addressing the community's challenges around housing. Uh, in 2021, the coalition completed the Park County Housing Needs Assessment, which at that time found that only 20% of households in Park County earned enough to afford a mortgage for a single family home at median list price. And then the following year, they completed the Housing Action Plan, which recommends a suite of 12 tools and policies to address the housing needs identified in the prior year's assessment. Um, this document was subsequently adopted. Uh, many of you participated in that into the City of Livingston's growth policies and the county's growth policy. Next slide, please. So phase two is all about implementing uh, the Housing Action Plan's 12 recommended tools and policies in a way that reflects community interest and capacity and leverages changes to policy and regulation at the national, state, and local level. So we're trying to be opportunistic and stretch our very limited resources just as far as they can go. Uh, we're also trying to sustain and build collaborative partnerships around community housing. Um, last year, an example of that is that the community raised nearly all of the funds necessary for HRDC to hire a Park County resident to lead these efforts full time for three years, which was the wish of folks who had been involved in the coalition at that point. Um, that person is me. We also convened a nine person steering committee that has been very, very helpful in guiding this work to date. Next slide, please. So just to touch again very briefly on where our housing market is at, um, generally we're seeing a lack of mobility in which people are either locked out of housing in the community, um, so they can't move here or take jobs here because they can't afford housing, or they're locked into homes that might not be meeting their needs. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that might mean in a bit. Um, about 30% of Park County's households rent and about 70% own and we're seeing home prices that neither can afford. Um, so this term affordability comes up a lot in conversations around housing. What does that actually mean? Well, a uh, rule of thumb is that when a household spends more than 30% of its income on housing, that housing is no longer considered affordable. Rather, instead, it's 
those households are now cost burdened by the cost of their housing. This rule of thumb is actually supported by a 2021 study titled Inflection Points in Community Level Homeless Rates, which found that uh, the expected homeless rate in a community begins to quickly increase once median rental costs exceed 30% of median income. So um, that's not just a rule of thumb. There is some research to support why that 30% metric is so important. And again, it's calibrated according to what a household is bringing in annually. So affordability for me might look different than affordability for you. Next slide, please. Um, so to talk about what these groups can afford, the estimated median rent is currently $434 more per month than the maximum the median renting household can afford. And only approximately 8% of owner households and 4% of renter households in Park County could afford a home priced at or above the December 2023 median list price of $649,000. So it's challenging for, for a lot of folks right now. Next slide, please. I know many of you are very familiar with the housing challenges that we're facing, so I don't want to dwell on that. I'm happy to talk about it more if you have questions, but I do want to focus on the work that we're doing um, to address this. Specifically in this presentation, I'm talking about some of our community-focused work, ways that we can empower community members to be a part of our housing solution. Because I'm just one person and our nine-person steer nine person steering committee are all volunteers, we're not going to make any progress unless we have people join us from the community and step forward. So to that end, our 2024 work plan, again, as I mentioned, prioritizes those three tools uh, from the 12 listed in the housing action plan. Um, and the implementation of these tools builds on recommendations made by the coalition's 2022 subcommittees. I know there are folks in this room who participated in the subcommittees, so thank you for that. Um, and ideas generated by participants during a conversation that the coalition hosted last November about how to implement some of these ideas in a successful manner. Next slide, please. So starting with accessory dwelling units, tool number eight in our housing action plan, uh, you might have heard accessory dwelling units referred to as ADUs or uh, fun terms like alley houses, mother-in-law units, or casitas, uh, names that all reveal how this housing type has been used in our community for generations. Um, as you might know, accessory dwelling units are simply smaller, independent living spaces that share a lot with a larger primary home. And they can either be attached to that home, detached uh, above a garage. There are a lot of different configurations. So they're a very flexible housing type. Their smaller size, ability to provide multi-generational housing on one lot, and the fact that they don't require an empty lot to build mean that they can meet several of the community's housing challenges. increase their access to housing that way. And they don't also have a lot of options in terms of homes that are appropriately sized for them. So uh, they're currently about two older. And I'm hearing anecdotally that some folks in our community are stuck in homes that are too large, require too much maintenance, or don't have needed accessibility features that will allow them to safely stay in their homes as they grow older. acquire a bunch of land. This is a, a solution that empowers homeowners to build upon land that they already own. So uh, the coalition's 2022 Workforce Housing Subcommittee program. 
Um, I'd also like to add that ADUs were a recommended approach within Headwaters Economics paper, the Are you financing that's coming up in mid-April? That's scheduled for April 11th. Um, and it's focused, it's designed to be continuing education for lenders, folks in real estate, builders, and other in the real estate realm so that they can understand what the financing mechanism is for this or financing mechanisms are for this flexible housing topology and um, provide accurate, timely advice to their clients and um help guide responsible investment in this type of housing. Uh, the follow-up to that will be a multi-session workshop this fall for homeowners wishing to build an accessory dwelling unit that will provide opportunities for community members to age in place or afford to continue living in Park County, particularly if they're working here. So that's our ADU pilot program for this year. And again, we're just sort of testing, testing things out to see what works best. And again, that's why that's why it's a pilot. We're not sure that this is going to be a silver bullet, but we're going to give it a try because there's a lot of community support and there are these other factors that have lined us lined up to set us up for success. Next slide, please. Great. So moving on to tool two in the housing action plan, we have employer assisted housing partnerships. So straight off the bat, I think when people hear the word employer and housing in the same sentence, they think I'm gonna be living in a home that my employer provides to me. And if I lose my job, I'm gonna lose my housing. Mm -hmm. So you can see on this slide, the first goal is to untether housing from specific jobs. However, our other goals are also to support the expansion of the local labor pool, improve recruitment and retention, and help our workers establish and maintain roots in our community. And so we're doing this by providing free technical assistance to employers who wanna step forward and work on this project with us. Um, we will help them figure out how to implement either demand or supply, stra supply side strategies to help their current employees access and remain in healthy housing in our community and improve recruitment and retention. So we can actually you know, expand departments that are staffed at 60% or 30% as the case may be. So um, we are targeting uh, employers in Park County's five economic sectors that represent about 70% of the county's jobs. So okay. next slide, please. And these sectors are professional and business services, education, healthcare, and social assistance, construction, leisure and hospitality, and retail trade. So on average, again, this is a different metric, different from median, on average, people working in these sectors fall into three annual earning groups. So there's data that's published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that provides annual averages for how much people are making in different sectors. So that's where we got this data from. And what we are noticing is that folks in these five sectors are earning, their earnings fall into roughly three categories. And we can work with employees and employers in the sector to calibrate solutions to the estimated annual incomes of their employees. And so that will help us sort of narrow down the suite of potential options. Like, you know, if your employees are most likely to be in professional business services, they might be in a position to be hoping to buy a home. And so we might look at solutions like down payment assistance. However, if your employees are largely in leisure and hospitality and retail trade, and they're making $33,000 a year on average annually, maybe we'll look at different solutions like establishing matched rental reserve accounts. Again, these will be tailored to the resources of the employers that we engage and the uh, needs of their employees. And that's another um, service that we can provide for free, which is help work within the HR departments of these um, employers to understand their employees' needs if they don't feel like they have a good handle on that. Um, a broader goal of this pilot program is to identify solutions that could be extended to workers across these five sectors. And again, we selected these sectors because they employ a significant number of 
uh, or they provide a significant number of jobs in Clark County. And so if we work with employers and find that something works for folks in this sector or this income range, we could potentially try and extend it to the community as a whole. So we are currently looking for employers in these sectors to step forward and make a commitment to contributing to the community. that could go towards something like down payment assistance, um, but we're open to all sorts of folks. Uh, again, another target group is um, employers that are big enough that they have the capacity to work on this. We're not expecting employees to step forward and try and figure this out, although they're absolutely reform and this year the coalition will be participating in the city of Livingston's plan zoning regulation update which I understand is slated to begin in June and generally our online or in the room today wants to participate in our work, here are some ways you can do it. You can participate in our ADU pilot. in your packet was a draft of a handout that I created for uh, the City of Livingston's yeah. planning department to help developers who are interested in accessing benefits available under the new planned unit development ordinance sort of navigate that ordinance and understand the benchmarks that they would need to meet in their development to access those benefits. And so far we've actually used that draft document in pre-development meetings um, and I've had types of housing that our community needs and can afford. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Questions, comments, commissioners? You know I have questions. I know you do. Thank yeah. you first for being here and like going through this. It was really helpful to hear what you had to say. It was like, I hope everybody gets a chance to listen to you. housing costs like in the same way that you do every day yeah for sure yeah, so the rent you were saying it's 484 dollars more yeah sorry are you ready carrie or... yeah i was just waiting yeah. now go okay, okay. It, there's a little lag time for folks Thanks. online yeah. yeah so i guess my question is like can you just go over it like one more time like the what people can afford in rent versus what it costs what people can afford in housing versus what it costs yeah it's like I just yeah hear it again. absolutely Thank so i that's a Thank you, Commissioner Nunes. And if you can go to the previous slide, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Gager, that would be great. Um, so on this slide, I included, so there is data available that not only has like a median household income for all of Park County, but you can get data that breaks it down in terms of folks who own their homes and folks who rent their homes. Mm -hmm. And in Park County, you see a pattern that exists across the nation, which is that folks who own their homes 
typically have a higher median income than folks who rent their homes. And so I've broken that out here uh, on this slide. And so folks who are renting households are likely to be earning or the median renting household income is a little less than fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars annually, and that's like adjusted uh, a twenty twenty two dollars adjusted for inflation, mm -hmm. and thirty percent of that number there, forty nine thousand six hundred and sixty dollars, mm -hmm. would be one thousand three hundred and sixty six dollars a month in rent, which is the maximum they could afford, right? right? Because as we've heard, there are some studies supporting this rule of thumb that once you exceed that threshold, you start seeing negative impacts in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and then for owners, it's a little bit different. It's not they're paying toward rent that the maximal affordable housing payment would be their mortgage, mm -hmm. for example. So if we go back to that subsequent slide, so, <laughs> and mortgage payments can be a little bit more difficult to suss out um, just because your debt to income ratio, the size of your down payment and interest rates can really affect how much your monthly payment is. But um, uh, Becky Miller with Opportunity Bank, who's one of our steering committee members, ran some numbers for us in November for our community discussion then. And I think for a home that was listed at $499,000, the monthly payment would be more than $4,000 a month, mm -hmm. right? So even, even if you're a current owning household, if you're making the median uh, amount of $86,190, it would be very difficult uh, for you to purchase a home below the median list price if you needed to move into a different home. Let's say your family grew mm -hmm. or your family contracted or something, mm -hmm. right? So that's what we're seeing with homeowners. And then in terms of rent, we have estimated the median rent. And this is something I'm continuing to work on to try and get better data on. Um, but if you were to pay $1,800 a month, which is the estimated median rent in Park County, you would need to be bringing in $73,000 a year, right? Which mm -hmm. is you know, more than $20,000 more than what our median rent or household is making. Um, so that's what I mean when people are either right. locked into housing that isn't working for them or just completely locked out of it. Um, and that's, that's why we're seeing challenges for both of those groups. Um, there's this other number on the slide here, which is a, an estimate that 28% of Park County households are cost burdened, so they're spending more than that 30% of their mm -hmm. income on housing. Um, I expect that to be a little bit higher. Um, that, S, that number is from the American Community Survey, but there was research published by the Harvard Joint Center of Housing Study, Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies uh, a few months ago that found that more than 50% of the nation's renters are cost burdened. Um, and given what we're seeing here, I expect that to be higher. Mm -hmm. Anecdotally, I also just get emails both from renters and homeowners who are, are struggling to um, stay in their homes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. That's really helpful just to hear it again. Yeah, of course. Um, There's a lot in there. There is. And it's helpful because like, I feel like the last time we maybe got it, it's been a long time mm -hmm. and it's only gotten more intense. And I will tell you, I, I would second your anecdotal evidence. When I was knocking doors like four years ago, I was hearing on people's porches, them share their like personal stories mm -hmm. with me about, mm -hmm. about their family changing and they really want to stay in Livingston, but they don't need a big family home anymore or like their physical abilities are changing mm -hmm. and like they don't have a place where they can age in place like you said so there's like a lot of and also the other end of the the other end of the spectrum where it's um kids getting older and parents being worried that their their children won't be able to like live near them or they won't be able to stay in their hometown things like that so I just want to say I heard that four years ago I heard it again this last election cycle that's I would agree with you that that's the real story of lots of people that live in our community um so thank you for bringing it and saying it out loud again because I think those people need to be heard by our whole community. Um, I do have some questions for you about um, ADUs. Yeah. Um, so I agree with you also that this is a commission that agrees with ADUs. Cause if you remember, we passed something long before it was when Matthew Menard was still here. Yeah. Um, and he worked on the ADU policy. So way before the state got involved, um, we were working to change the policy before we did change the policy before the state got involved. 
but I wanted to ask you about um, one of the things I've learned about ADUs is in places that have had ADU policies like ours um, without, and I do appreciate these, it's something about deed restrictions, so that's where I'm going with this. Um, when there are no restrictions, what, and I've looked at studies from communities around the US and even out of the US, um, they find that ADUs do, do create affordable housing, but it's typically for people who are already above the median average and those housing opportunities go directly to like their parents or their children, mm -hmm. which is great. Also yeah. like those people need to be housed, but it doesn't necessarily address the other things you brought up like about workforce mm -hmm. or 30% that doesn't have access to those kinds of parents, right? Yeah. And so I wonder um, what, like what, uh, like what are you thinking in terms of like helping to make sure that we don't end up with just a lot of ADUs that are unaffordable for our community? Do you have thoughts on what's possible? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that's a great question. One of the things that the Park County Housing Coalition is doing internally, and it will be public or like more external facing moving forward. But um, one of our subcommittees last winter was focused on developing a fund to support different types of housing interventions in the community, mm -hmm. including potentially a loan or grant program for accessory people wishing to build accessory dwelling units. And um, this pilot program is intended to work with folks who want to build an ADU that would contribute to community housing. And we would collaborate with participants in that workshop to figure out what a enticing enough package basically would be for these folks to, you know, either in the form of a grant, a zero interest loan that's repaid when the property is sold, a super low interest loan. What, what is that along with, you know, maybe pro bono legal advice that helps you draw up a deed restriction or something. But what is that sweet group of incentives that will encourage people to deed restrict either uh, in perpetuity or for a definite term because I recognize that people need you know like value flexibility with their properties mm -hmm. and we want to hear from homeowners who are embarking on this journey we're providing technical support to them and potentially this other package and what uh where's where can we get our most bang for a buck because mm -hmm. again yeah our intention is not to create housing for those that already are super well resourced or create an income stream for folks who already have plenty of income. This is to support the creation of community housing. I do I do think that there are some lessons from other places too in terms of like how, how incentives get deployed. Um, and I think what I'm hearing in your question is sort of like an equity issue, like how, you know, basically like if we're helping people create an asset that could potentially then create a new revenue stream, how do we make sure that we're offering those opportunities to folks throughout our community, not just like a small subset of our population that is already well resourced. And I think one of the challenges that I'm still learning about with that is that it requires quite a bit of money to build an ADU. Right. And so one of the findings that I'm hearing from similar programs is that like you have to be careful about engaging people in something that is so expensive so that you're not setting them up for failure if they're having trouble like making payments on mm -hmm. this asset, right? Yeah. And so I think that will be something that we explore in the creation of that program as well, um, because mm -hmm. I do think it would be important to make sure there are options to extend this resource equitably to all of our community members who own property and like are considering this, but we have to do it responsibly. And I think one of the puzzle pieces to that that we are working on right now is this financing course and just understanding like what different lending institutions, like what options there are from different lending institutions, what the parameters are, so that like people are getting um, accurate advice and sort of responsible advice about how to invest in their property. So, I mean, I don't, I guess all of that is to say is that is something that we are thinking about and we haven't figured out exactly how that'll work yet. And so, um, yeah, if you have research on that or other people participating in this meeting today, like we would love to hear about it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I like that you're talking about um 
like thinking about it equitably and I mean it like in the most honest sense of the word like a lot of people in our community and the whole county really are the numbers up on that screen mm -hmm. that would not be able to afford where we live today mm -hmm. um and also recognizing that like the state over and over again has shown us they do not have local interests in mind right we saw that through all sorts of zoning reform that did not consider local interests. We saw it, obviously we hear about it in taxes all the time. Um, they are not considering local interests. Like it's only getting more expensive because of the state, like the city lowered taxes. <laughs> we were the only ones, but it wasn't enough to offset like what the state did, right? So um, all of those things compounding on local residents who are facing houselessness mm -hmm. um, when they're in a life transition. So I really appreciate that. The things that I have read have been like from communities and these are like, you know, peer reviewed research papers. Um, the communities that look back like five to 10 years, they didn't have any um, sort of side rails around the policy. When they passed policy, they just like opened it up to ADUs. They found themselves creating it's almost I don't want to say they were creating more of the problem but they were benefiting the people that didn't need the benefits through mm -hmm. public policy yeah and public policy should be equitable it shouldn't just be benefiting the wealthiest people of the community and so that's sort of like what I'm thinking is how do we make sure we're the people that come to these meetings right people that have like they take time out of their busy lives to come make phone calls or emails or whatever um, answer the door when we knock to tell us about housing. I want to make sure that like our policy and our choices are impacting like the regular people in Livingston. Um, and I think like what I have learned is what you're also saying that we need to think about it before we get too far down the road to make sure we're inclusive and not excluding the people who actually need. So thank you for that. I'm happy to like keep chatting about it. Great. At meetings or not. <laughs> um, and I had another question. So you start talking about businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I really like this too, because this is something that um, all these things that we've, since I was early on the commission, I want to say 2019 is when um, I made a motion to put the housing action plan in our strategic plan, actually. So that's how long we've been thinking about all these things. So I like that you have a focus on educating and offering assistance to the people who live here. Thank you. I also like that you want to work with business owners. Thank you. Can it be really small business owners that don't have lots of employees? I mean, if if they want to try and like talk through it with us, they're absolutely welcome to. And but we didn't want to make it seem like we have the expectation that somebody who has had their business open for three years and has no employees is going to volunteer and make this thing a success. I feel like if there's enough really small business yeah. owners that want to like help, maybe there's like a path for all these like smaller business owners too, to like oh, be a part of the solution. So absolutely. And is there a way that they can learn more before they say yes, that they want to commit and what yes. would that look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they can just reach out to me and okay. my email is in the slides. It's kdaily at the okay. Um, But again, like I was saying, it looks different based on you know, who we're working with, right? Sure. And the, the resources that they have available and the needs of their employees. And again, you know, something we're just trying to do is I'm hearing from uh, business owners of all different sizes that they are now, they are now doing the thing that they do best and some other things, which is property development and property management that right. they did not get into, <laughs> uh, that did not inspire them to become business owners. And we want to help sort of take that weight back from them. Um, yeah, that's through, awesome. Yeah. I think it's great. I'm really excited about these two parts, especially. I, um, well, I'm excited about zoning because I've made it in a secret that I'm excited about the zoning before this year. <laughs> um, but for the commenting, I just want to get clarity around the commenting on zoning. Mm -hmm. Is that like, are you going to be commenting and like working with staff or are you going to be like, I'm just going to say like lobbying the commission? I mean, I... I would love, personally, I'm just one commissioner. I would love if you're working with staff and educating the public. I feel like we're already on board because we partnered with HRDC and voted on it. Yeah. So like, I don't, I don't need to be convinced personally that we need affordable housing in Livingston. Um, I would love it if that effort went to like working directly with business owners and community members to help them get housed or find housing, create housing for their people. Cause I think that's like the highest need in my mind more than I trust that if we we create an opportunity for HRDC to work right with staff, 
And if that seems more efficient to me, then because of those recommendations will come through in staff reports. That's just what I was thinking. I don't know all that you speak, what your thoughts were on commenting, what that looks like for you. Yeah, I mean, I like it's helpful to hear the commission's direction on that. And, you know, we and do, I'm just one. I'm not no, directing no, anything. Sorry. Myself, yeah. No, it's okay. <laughs> Commissioner Nudes' direction on that. Um, and I think, you know, I think that will heavily inform the relationship. I, I guess in terms of like my preference, I agree that we can have a much more productive conversation um, if we are working with a consultant who gets hired and working with staff um, to develop drafts and develop educational materials. I mean, I do think that that is a role that the Park County Housing Coalition is well positioned to play. And that's something that uh, um, City Manager Gager and I have discussed. Um, and that is a way that the Park County Housing Coalition is working with the city already, is like providing these materials that help people understand the language of housing because it is a very jargon heavy field and um, yep. zoning uh, and land use is no different. Um, so yeah, that would certainly be my my preference. Um, Maybe I'll ask Mr. Gator too, so yeah. you run our contracts. Like, do you have thoughts on that part? Just Yes, absolutely. It, it is our intention to involve the our County Housing Coalition in the work that the consultant team will be doing. And by the way, the request for proposals is that we're on the street and uh, proposals are due back about three weeks from now. So cool. we will uh, be awarding that contract in the, in the coming uh, months. But I, I would say that the, the work that we will do with Catherine and, and PCHC on the zoning work will mirror what we're already doing today on some of our uh, housing work and educational work where, you know, Catherine, we've got a meeting at 2 p.m. on Thursday, yeah. this new schedule from last week that is we're actually meeting with a, uh, a, a possible affordable housing uh, development team. Cool. Uh, and so uh, we have we've integrated her into our work process as much as she'll allow us. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I um. I feel like I've taken up enough of your time with my questions. I really appreciate you taking time to have a deeper conversation with me at this level during a public meeting without any warning of what I was gonna ask you. Thank you, um, super brave. Um, and thank you for clarity on that aspect too. This is new, right? Like the city hasn't always partnered in this way for housing. So it's good to get clarity also so the community sort of like knows. Yeah. Like, thank you. I really am excited about like opportunities for direct engagement with the public. Thank you so much. Hey, yeah, that's yeah. great. You're very welcome. I'm finally done. <laughs> Other commissioners? Um, I'll just share uh, in my capacity as the non-voting member of the uh, coordinated land use board uh, that, that Catherine gave a presentation to us a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think is an important audience to be aware of what's going on. Um, and uh, so that group got this presentation as well. Commissioner Willett, anything? I am digesting, okay. um, but I have good questions. Thank you very okay. much for your presentation. I think you answered, you asked all the good questions. So um, thank you, Catherine, for that presentation. I've heard this part of this presentation once before yeah. already too. So um, really great. Thank you. I'm excited to see what the coalition can do as you all work together uh, to move forward. I feel like there's some really great momentum and you're making progress and it's exciting. And I've kind of been in the committee that got this all started way before I was a commissioner to see where it's gotten now and seeing that momentum, I'm really excited. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so glad I was a pain at that strategic plan meeting. <laughs> Great. Um, I also wanted to say, like, if the commission is like curious about any issues um, and would like policy briefs on issues pertaining to housing, that is also something that I can do as part of the partnership that we have with the city of Livingston. So if you're like, what would it look like for the city to do X? I would be happy to provide information on that and give a presentation or run through opportunities and challenges. So I'm here as a resource if you, uh, yeah, would like policy support on housing issues and I'm happy to work with the wonderful city uh, policy and analyst, Greg Anthony, mm -hmm. on those things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank All you, right. Catherine. Thank you. Okay. All right, we have another scheduled public comment. It's my land LLC, Leslie. And Mr. Gator, did you have a introduction? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that I have had the opportunity, or the pleasure to uh, attend several uh, meetings of It's My Land LLC in the uh, almost year and a half that I've been here. And 
uh, Vice Chair Newt's actually mm -hmm. attended quite a few of those with me as well. And so um, I will uh, turn it over to uh, to Leslie to um, take it away. <laughs> I have to follow all of that. <laughs> I don't have a presentation up here. Um, so thank you, commissioners, uh, for this evening, for your time. And um, uh, commission chair, I wanted to um, go over just a few pieces of the history to where we are today. And um, in June of 2021, the city um, updated its growth policy, spent quite a bit of time. I was on all of the calls with um, a few of you. Uh, and when it came to the, the section of its uh, ETJ, um, that was very, uh, I mean, it took a few weeks, few meetings to even get through it, over 1,200 different respondents, um, because it became really clear that the um, that when you're talking about a future land use map, um, the people in the county who don't have a vote or a say or a voice within the city, it became very apparent that moving forward that, you know, we might be looking at some future changes that um, the people in the county really weren't looking forward to, which then sparked us off by having some, you know, major conversations in September of 21. There was um, a attempt at a city county land use board that didn't really go as planned either. And um, then fast forward to March, uh, March of 22, uh, I had my first meeting um, called a bunch of friends and a lot of uh, neighbors and said, we really need to pay attention to what's going on because at the time we had a different city commission and a different city management team that had some really big ideas, lofty ideas about making big fluffy circles and things like that around the city, uh, clean lines. And it was um, really apparent that there were some directions that people in the county were not prepared for. Um, since then, we started having uh, monthly meetings. Uh, we created an LLC. We are registered with the Secretary of the State um, for the last couple of years, PO Box email, all the good stuff. We have town hall meetings, um, which are very packed full of people. The last one uh, filled up the fairgrounds. So, um, you know, it's, um, it's about finding the landowner's voice in the county uh, about what they believe um, that they do not have a voice within the city, as we know voters rules within the state of Montana, um, but they wanted to find a way to be able to um, you know, convey their message. We know that ETJ is a sensitive subject across the United States, um, around the nation, places like Houston, Austin, North Carolina, I mean, many different states um, are dealing with some major issues and that is all about growth and the right kind of growth. And when the ETJs were originally designed, it was about um, creating cities and then about smart growth of your city for the future. And this was done a long time ago. Um, and, you know, so that you just didn't have urban sprawls with no cities. So fast forward to where we are today, it's becoming issues because it's how fast can a city give the services to people within an ETJ like we have here? where um, the land on the east side of town was thought through and went through very fast and without the process of having everything in place in the first place. Um, but, you know, I'm standing here today because of, because of what happened on the east side of town. And I attempted to help them with, you know, knowing Montana code, um, but at the time we couldn't get anywhere with the city, um, couldn't figure out a way to help show them that there were exclusions. and you know, the um, circle or wholly uh, surrounded were, you know, were not the right way of, you know, taking people's land out of the county and putting them into the city. Um, and uh, Montag area was just caught off guard with that. And uh, so moving forward, you know, talking with those folks um, and all the other folks around the ETJ through our meetings, through our engagement, neighbors knocking on doors, we um, have a uh, submittal to give to you today that um, has just a few other copies and it's actually been updated um, since we gave it to you last week. Uh, last week, I believe we had um, 397. Um, as of today, we have in this package 391 signature pages to submit to you. Um, so we have, and they're they're coming in all the time, uh, 
so there'll be more coming along the way. And um, I wanted to read to you the submittal and the reason why that we did this. So um, in connection with the proposed contemplated growth policy and land use related matters occurring in Park County in the city of Livingston, the summary submittal is presented to the Livingston City Commission as a group individually. Attached herewith is a document titled Citizens Declaration and Statement of Positions Regarding Land Use. The advocacy position stated and said Citizens Declaration a majority are agreed upon, affirmed and confirmed by the attached personal signatures of 391 citizens, property owners, and registered voters within the three mile county commission districts of the uh, three county commission districts of the ETJ, which is the majority. The, sign the signees in support of the citizens declaration serve as a collective voice and strongly demonstrate a significant common engagement regarding the state issued and concerns. Such engagement is exemplary to the process and principles of representative government with uh, part within Park County and calls for careful due consideration in every regard by this commission in the future. So I will attach this new sheet on here and our um, declaration, we thought long and hard in our boards um, and, and different um, engaged citizens came together for each of the meetings, some of those that you had um, visited. And uh, we really went through and made sure that all of the items on here were going to make sense to both the county commissioners and the city commission that, you know, not having a voice, but taking it in concern if you do make a future proposal um, down the road, say a developer comes to you and um, you know, is purchasing some land or looking at some land, taking this into consideration. Uh, we do have some land that became annexed by the city and it was folks from out of the area that purchased some land after um, somebody had passed away. Now we do have in one particular area of our ETJ, a lot of um, older persons living that really don't want to have to worry about every day, like if somebody's going to come take their land or if they're going to have to move or be a part of the city. The ETJ, again, without getting too far as task here, is simply that we chose to live in the county close enough to the city um, that I myself live in an area that I wanted to be able to go to the hospital because I have horses and that happens. Um, <laughs> you know, close enough to going to Albertsons in the winter when there's snow everywhere, but not in the city because we like our country way of living. We like, you know, our land and we chose it for a reason mm -hmm. um, where we did. And not to have ever I, in my wildest dreams thought that I would be standing up in front of you today after purchasing my land in the county and going, wow, I, I have a battle down the road. I, I would have never dreamt that. Um, we know the changes and are inevitable. We know that growth is inevitable. And we know, you know, now that we've been hearing from the city commission that infill and the city manager infill is important. Um, we do have land that we can grow infill. We don't want to become a big city um, or do we, but we simply just don't want to be a part of the big city life. So I'm going to submit this to you and I'm, I, definitely can take questions of all kinds. Um, the uh, uh, Just wanted to leave you with one fact that um, there was a lawsuit back in, it was kind of funny because it's actually, uh, Bruce Becker was the lawyer and it was our governor and he, his property in Bozeman is in the ATJ and there was a huge lawsuit and he won to remain there because of the exemption rule um, with the state of Montana. And so people are willing to stand up to it. They're willing to, you know, fight for the land. And I'm just hoping that you, uh, all of you commissioners, please tonight, just remember that and remember that all of these voices are within two miles, 43 square acres, 43, 43 square miles. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, of surrounding Livingston, all of these signatures. There's a lot of voices here. So I'm going to give this to you. To, I'm assuming you. Yeah. Yeah. We won't lose this one, I promise. Please. We have coffee. <laughs> and we're on the camera. <laughs> it's recorded. And it's recorded. Yeah. Commissioner's questions? 
Amen. Might as well. well our, our commissioner knew it. Yeah, I think okay. I did it too. I realized that's it. And I um, yeah, I'm just trying to think like where to begin. Um, so how about at the beginning? Um, I was a commissioner when a lot of things happened. Um, that you met that you referenced. I think we all like agree in retrospect that none of us were given all of the information or the same information as each other, which is um, not okay. So I just wanna like say that out loud and on the record, um, this commission, or at least four fifths of it, um, Commissioner Willich wasn't here yet. And this city manager, um, we did waive all of the fees that we could waive when more information came forward and we learned all of the information we needed, we waived all of the fees that we could for those residents. And we've been doing everything we can since then as a commission. And I would say also city staff, we voted on like so many grants um, and like funding opportunities. As promised at the time, we would we would move forward and try to help the community fund things like the city always does, but the city has continued to keep that promise and it's been a priority. Certainly, Mr. Gager's been here. Um, he's heard the commission loud and clear when we told him we don't want this. We don't want to, we don't want people to have to come to the commission, right, to hear, to have their voices heard. It should never have to get to that. It should have to get to that point sometimes, but it shouldn't with this one. It shouldn't have had to keep, they shouldn't have had to keep coming back to us, right? After like however many years in. So I just want to acknowledge all of that and say we're with the community. I mean, I knocked on doors in that neighborhood. I talked to those people. I had like honest conversations on people's porches. I will totally, I'll like own that none of us had all the information. At least maybe some people did, but not most of us. Um, okay, so that was the beginning. And then um, you went through a little timeline. I'll just correct like two things. One, we actually had 1,600 comments, not 1,200. <laughs> I'm the, uh, I'm the, yeah, yeah, like on the well, on the whole growth policy, we had to have special meetings, like you said, and we listened to the county residents. And Matthew Menard, our planning director at the time, did incorporate comments and recommendations. We were not discriminating based on people's addresses. So, this is like a planning board and a commission and a city government that does work with county residents, and we value you all. And I, um, you know, we're people and we're not perfect, but like we also punted something over to that. We we try to like engage with the county as much as we can. We're people and we're not perfect and we're doing our best, but it is something that we've demonstrated through policy over and over again that we do listen to county residents. Maybe other commissions didn't, maybe other chairs didn't, but at least since we've been sitting at this table together, we have, and this manager has been. <laughs> um, and then in 2021, yes, there was pressure on the commission to do a combined board. I remember, because I was probably sitting over there when it happened. Um, and the commission said, no, if you remember, there was pressure on the commission that we needed to do it. And we said, no, and we didn't do it. So just validating also, I remember that I was there, we didn't do it. Um, I appreciated coming to your meetings. Thank you for inviting Mr. Gager and me. It's very helpful to like listen to people directly um, that live in the ETJ. And also like one thing that was really informative to me um, was the diversity of, I'm not a county commissioner, I'm a city commissioner, right? I know that there's diversity between neighborhoods in Livingston, but it was really helpful for me to like hear about the diversity of people in the ETJ. Well, like in that each neighborhood has really unique concerns of like how they wanna maintain their way of life in their particular part of the county. So I appreciate that you like allowed us to share space and for people to tell us their stories. Um, I remember like the wine glass, for example, there was a gentleman, more than one, but there are people in the wine glass 
um, that had really specific needs and wants for their neighborhood. And then there were people in, and you've told me some of your personal concerns, um, green, uh, not green, uh, the five acre tracks, um, really different set of concerns, right? Real different, maybe, maybe some overlapping, but some different concerns and wants and needs than the wine glass and on and on and on around the county, right? Everybody has like their unique little, little, little neighborhood. Um, one thing we had talked about, because this, you brought it up tonight, and I just want to reiterate it here, um, your concerns with um, somebody that sells off their land in the county, and then that new landowner has ideas that might not comply with the pre-existing landowners, right? And especially as you get close to town, right? We're seeing that happen. More land switch hands are white timber. There's an example. They wanted to be annexed because they couldn't carry on their business without the city of Livingston. So that's like an example of like a large landowner that wanted to be annexed. It's a totally different example than the ones that you're talking about, but you're, but the ones that you're talking about are real, right? So like if somebody is a big landowner and they're, they're surrounding and sandwiching in county residents, and then they ask to be annexed, right? They've created a pocket of county surrounded by city. And now puts pressure on all these people that never wanted to be annexed, where they're going to be forced by law now, state law, to tie into city infrastructure and be annexed. So like there's some things about the state law that are out of our hands, right? And I think that's kind of one of the things we talked about at that meeting, if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, there we there's only so much that we can do to help. Um, I would, you know, ask Mr. Gager like what is our jurisdiction? What can we do? Because I think there's, I don't think that we can do anything really in the county anyway. Um, and like, I don't think we can just go out and do whatever we want. And um, also how, how do those county landowners help themselves from the kind of development that they don't want? Um, I know some of the things we talked about were like, citizen initiated zoning, which there's rural residents all over the state that do that as a way to like protect their little neighborhoods um, from outside pressures that are trying to change, right? There's some examples in Helena and or outside of Helena and all sorts of places. So I don't know like where you're at with that, if you're still working to help people advocate to do what they can without the city or the county. Um, but it occurs to me that that, I don't know how that would interface with the city policy. I would be interested in what Mr. Gager says, like if there's some tools that county residents could use to help protect themselves, because if there's a big landowner that like comes into play and then they sandwich in a bunch of the county, um, like we've seen, um, and then they ask to be annexed, like our way timber, for example, like it, that's like a different scenario than what we're talking about happened in the past. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Leslie. Um, and if you don't, that's okay. And I also want to ask Mr. Gager, like, if you have your thoughts on, like, what we can or can't do, how would CIZs or something like that come into play with, if it was abutting city land? Do you have thoughts on any of that? Uh, you know, I I, um, I have some thoughts. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I guess Leslie and I have had this conversation several times and I've had the pleasure to say it to her membership but I just want to be clear to everybody here that neither myself nor any member of staff nor any contracted city attorney or any contractor that we use is is actively working on annexations or uh, looking at expanding the city in any way uh, we were approached by two landowners as you noted and and that drove those those annexation processes so I, I do just want to let everybody in the room and, and at home know that the city of Livingston in no way is expending any effort on annexation. That said, we do understand that uh, property changes hands from time to time. And um, and and so, you know, we have reviewed uh, Montana code annotated fairly extensively. There does not appear to be any power for the city to extend its zoning um, or control over the ETJ, uh, given our current makeup of the Consolidated Land Use Board and that it is not a joint city county board. And so, um, you know, as, as I look at it, we really have no power in the ETJ unless invited in um, by a landowner. Um, that said, as you pointed out, uh, Vice Chair Newts, there are other tools like CIZs um, that are available in the state of Montana and are 
actively used in unzoned county areas. Um, it, it's my understanding those, and I, I welcome others here, but it's my understanding those can be created uh, adjacent to the municipal boundary. Mm -hmm. So people that are in the, the five acre tracks, for instance, are not precluded from pursuing that mechanism if that's what they so desire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I um, want to give you a chance to, because I just like said a lot of things and I, right. These conversations are super important. You know, one thing that we found out through this process over the last two years um, is that those people on those papers right there, they've all got to know each other. They've, um, I mean, our last town hall meeting, uh, which I always advocate for, because that's what we do here. Um, was pretty incredible because people that hadn't seen each other in a long time, neighbors started knocking on neighbors' doors and talking to them. Um, it's about the advocacy of the and reminding them that you know we can continue on to have this life, and the um, you know families talking about the future plans of their properties. You know when something happens to mom or dad, um, and what they you know plan on doing with the property after they're gone. Um, so this is kind of like. You know, it that's part of it is is just being able to have that communication piece, and uh, which is part of you know having these documents. It that's our communication piece to you. You know, it's if a developer would you know I I was very aware of what was going on there with Sutton Mountain Lumber, and and that's why they only did like you know half of their property, just the part the insurance company needed them to do. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, and we understand that things like that are going to happen. Is you know. Uh, business changes. Um, but it's, I think that uh, this has just been such an open door um, conversation piece around the ETJ that that's, you know, that's what we were looking for. We were looking to be a part of the conversation, to have the voice. And that means even with future development. I guess I would just like encourage you if you all are really wanting to like have some long term vision to consider what your options are. Um, my last job, I don't work there anymore, but my last job, I worked with um, community members all over the state. And so some of them were like, I don't know, I want to say like five acre track type communities or maybe even um, like wine glass type communities, you know, like adjacent to towns, definitely more rural livestock, things like that. Um, and like, a couple landowners or one landowner that had a large parcel would have an idea and they'd like sell their um like sell their property to like an open cut operator and in the middle of a neighborhood they'd want to put like a giant asphalt plant mm -hmm. and this has happened all over the state and it continues to happen um and when those landowners don't have protections they literally have everything to lose um the future passing it down to their kids um <laughs> quietness like the open cut laws um, changed. Um, there's a representative up in Libby actually who really opened the door for open cut operators. So now they can go like 24 seven um, <laughs> without restrictions on like noise and light, which completely like changes the characteristic of a neighborhood, right? Like the wine glass or five, five acre tracks. Um, so, I mean, that reality is real all over Montana. Um, I would encourage you because it'd be nice if you guys have a long-term vision for what you want to do is communities as you've been, you know, growing together and connecting that you think about what your options are, because if that happens and those, all it takes is like one person that owns a big chunk of land to sell it. Right. And that new landowner isn't, you know, part of your current network or they have different ideas and they're focused on, you know, profits and they don't even live in that neighborhood. Um, we won't be able to help you. And I don't know that the County will be able to help you and the state has made it easier. Um, so just thinking about those things because you guys all matter and you matter to us. And that's why we listen to you. That's all. No, I appreciate that. And, you know, knowing that we have such a, you know, a collaborative voice now, um, we're definitely already looking at what the, you know, the upcoming changes to the county growth policy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have some other serious things like the initiative. Mm -hmm. um, we have come together with some of our other groups in the area, like friends of Park County and PCEC and looking at what the new growth policy when it comes to the land use and subdivision rules, which um, that came up on the County Commission today too. We definitely have a plan in place to be able to part of this conversation so that our area is definitely going to be um, protected in one way or another. But, you know, again, I just wanted to 
reiterate that original uh, conversation came to us when um, this was months ago about zoning, about looking at our area to be zoned by the city. Um, there are a couple exemptions that, you know, that could take place. And that was one of the things we, you know, zoning first, not the annexations. Now, if somebody wants to be annexed, we're not going to use the pitchforks and little fire things can march on their door. We just want to be able to have the conversation and, you know, moving yes. forward. So just wanted to say that. And um, I appreciate your comments on that. Leslie, who was saying that the city wants to zone first? So the zoning, um, the zoning discussion came up. That was last year about zoning us and zoning the ETJ um, through uh, you had. I mean, I saw it on the notes um, before you took it off the website. So the zoning meetings. And it was under land use discussions with zoning um, areas in the ETJ with um, commercial and residential. It was like when all the new zoning regulations were being put together. And so that was one of the discussions hmm. was zoning. And I saw it on the minutes and I ran to, we had a meeting very quickly. So now that I've since then had a wonderful conversation with Jennifer Severson um, and understood exactly what you all are seeing here today. And you know we'll continue to have those meetings and those conversations moving forward, especially with you know not knowing how the growth policy for the county is going to go, and how that's going to affect us. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. You, thank you for coming and sharing, and continue to be open and interactive and engage with the city. Absolutely, thank you. Other commissioners? Yeah, I'll say something. Uh, it's been rude repeatedly pointed out that I wasn't part of the uh, commission for this. Uh, but I will say that as this commissioner personally believes that I don't think the city limits should change at all. It should be very difficult to be added in unless you are requesting. Them. And so my humble uh, 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 opinion of this is that the ETJ should be essentially off limits to the best of the city's ability to stay off limits. Um, I thank you for setting up a unified voice so you can fight when something, a extraneous kind of situation gets set up. Um, it's a lot stronger to have a whole lot of people come and sit and talk to you. Um, and I wish the best of luck to stay how you like it. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole point of property ownership, right? Is to live on your property, peaceful enjoyment. And that's what I strive for is peaceful enjoyment. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lines. Thank you. My share needs to go in it. Okay. Um, it's a rarity. <laughs> I would just, you know, I as as my share you've said, I would also just sort of consider some of those other options that you have as county residents, whether it's citizens in the shaded zoning or neighborhood plans or whatever it might be so that you can, you know, protect those areas that you're living in. So when someone unfortunately passes and their land gets sold to someone else, you already kind of have a plan in place for that area, right? So that you know that this is, this is as, as neighbors, as 391 of us came together or 200 of us in this other neighborhood, this is really what we want to see for our, for our neighborhood. And this is our vision. And you know, you can do that through citizen initiated zoning, whether it's 101 or 201. Um, your growth policy in the county is so important as well, you know, because that's going to give you some some regulation and some help and some vision of what that should look like as well. Um, you know, so I would just thank you for this and you know, for getting all to coming together. But I would, you know, I would also say if there's ways that you can as groups come together and help yourselves and vision for your neighborhoods and your communities, you know, your smaller communities to, to take that opportunity and, you know, to do that. Um, thank you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Gager, um, I just wondered if you had any um, to wrap No, up I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity, uh, Chair Kale. I, you know, I guess I would, I would just reiterate one more time that there is not a single person on my staff or that we contract with that is working on annexations in any way whatsoever. And the only time we even really read the word annexation is 
when we're approached by some of the as we were very recently that few properties. So um, hopefully that gives you some measure of comfort. There's one more thing else I also want to say. Okay. Because I realize that this table has changed significantly mm -hmm. since all of that stuff happened. And I have said before, I didn't know all of the things, mm -hmm. but I still think it's something that needs to be said that I'm sorry, like on behalf of the city of Livingston, that I am sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry that all of that happened the way that it did and it's not okay. Thank I mean, you. as long as I'm sitting here, I mean, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure something like that doesn't happen again, mm -hmm. like the way that it happened and what people were told. I'm not gonna repeat it up here at this table, but it's yeah. not okay, so. I'm Thank sorry. you. I appreciate that a lot. And I'm sure everybody that's listening tonight appreciates that as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. It's 7.02. Okay. I'm going to ask for if someone would uh, make a motion for break. I'll make a motion for a break. Okay. Motion. Uh, 10 minutes. Second. Yeah. All in favor? All right. All right. Take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 7.12. Save that for commissioner comment. Yes, I oh, sure. Hey, apologies. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call back to order this uh, Livingston City Commission yeah. meeting at 7:14. Uh, we are moving on down the agenda, and so this is action item A: uh, projects submission for for State Local Infrastructure Partnership Act 2023, Montana, HB 355, Mr. Gager. Thank you, Chair Kale. The item before the commission this evening is um, a follow-up of a conversation that we had in late December uh, related to uh, House Bill uh, 355, which is also known as the State Local Infrastructure Partnership Act. And um, the Montana State Legislature uh, allocated $20 million to cities based on their population for infrastructure projects uh, and the, with the proviso that, um, that the, the work would require a 25% local match. And uh, I've included the, the, the program guidelines uh, in the packet for you folks. Um, really, the, the highlights are that the city uh, is expected to be awarded uh, a little north of $583,000 for infrastructure projects. Uh, they must actually be for infrastructure and not uh, personnel or equipment. And uh, funds must be expended by uh, December 31st of 2027. Mm -hmm. And the, the city is responsible for any cost overruns. And so uh, you may recall, we held a public hearing in December to um, solicit project ideas, and 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 we uh, heard very, uh, I and staff heard very firmly from the commission and some community members that there was a uh, desire to work on pedestrian um, and non-motorized vehicle improvements, and um, we have included uh, two projects um, as as potential requests. Um, one is uh, is a pedestrian related project um, related to Park Street crossing improvements. The city has been working with um, some outside funding partners to uh, to bring that project forward um, to install some rapid flashing beacons on Park Street to include or to increase safety there mm -hmm. uh, for community members and and staff at this time is is also recommending um, that that the city use a uh, almost about three quarters of the funding um, to uh, to work on the unpaved streets within the city, um, both up in the, the, the soccer field area, as well as on the eastern part of town that was uh, discussed a little bit earlier, uh, recently annexed into, into the city. And, you know, I, I, I want to reassure the commission here um, that that staff is, is not ignoring uh, your comments or the community's comments. Uh, in relation to pedestrian and non-motorized improvements. Um, rather, as, as uh, myself and, and some team members dug into this, um, we, we really, uh, we wanted to be able to use these monies um, relatively expeditiously and to improve the situation of, of some Livingston, Livingston residents 
um, as quickly as we could. And we hear quite frequently about the unpaved streets. Um, and uh, and we have a very simple off the uh, shelf solution that we employed selectively in the Green Acres neighborhood at the conclusion of the construction project um, last fall. And we've been monitoring the, the condition of those roadways and, and, and they appear to be performing very well. Um, at, at a very low cost and very quickly and easily implementable solution. And so um, that, that was the genesis of, of that recommendation. Whereas when we look at um, sidewalks with, within the city, um, th there is both a, an assessment uh, task to really identify where our missing or um, suboptimal sidewalk segments are. And then we have a, a separate uh, design uh, and engineering task um, to, to do uh, the, the preparation for the construction work. And so um, it, it, it is a worthwhile project and, and one that we are still pursuing and, and will very likely appear in the city manager's recommended budget uh, that's presented to you within the next several months. Um, but uh, it, it seemed like uh, using these a portion of these funds for the unpaved streets uh, may provide more immediate uh, improvements for the community. So I will uh, stand for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Commissioner, some questions? Um, I'm just looking through the project completion by December 31, 27. So we're expecting probably 25 for both of these projects completion. Um, well, there's actually a, a very good chance that we will schedule much of the unpaved road work for for this construction season in, okay. in calendar 2024, okay. um, and uh, and potentially some of the crossing work. We are uh, there's a, a larger coordination effort with MDT, right? So we are holding out hope that we may be able to do some of that work this construction season, but at the latest, the the crossing work, if approved by the commission, would be handled likely by 2025 for sure. Thank you. Other commissioners, questions? Oh, I just have one question. Uh -huh. So I know the issues in Green Acres um, was just like how unsafe the roads were before, you know, without any treatment, like when there was like a lot of um, precipitation, like and temperatures were changing really quickly. Um, have has this like permazine and chip seal gone through actual weather where we can see how it holds up? Yes, we uh, we installed the permazine, um, I believe, in August of this last year, and we have been monitoring it since then. We've received a fair amount of rain, not as much snowfall as we might have hoped, mm -hmm. uh, but but we've we've run the plows and and other equipment over okay. uh, over those roads and um, and we have a number of staff members that live in the community that are mm -hmm. uh, our eyes on the ground there. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm. I'd entertain a motion. Um, I can do it. If you guys want? I'll do it. James has got it. Okay. Uh, I approve the submission of applications to the HB 355 program for the projects presented. Second. Okay. And James, I'm just going to speak. You make a motion to approve, right? I just didn't hear the motion part. So yeah, okay. it wasn't written in there. Yeah, okay, I just read okay. what was written. Great. Okay. Sorry. So, I make a motion to approve. Thank mm -hmm. you. I just want to make sure of that. Okay. So, Commissioner Willich with the motion, a second by Commissioner Lyons. Okay. Now we'll open it up to public comment. Um, I don't have anybody in the room. I've emptied out pretty quickly. Anyone online? Would anyone online like to make a public comment um, about uh, HB 355? Feel free to raise your hand or just come off mute and give us your name and address. Hi, um, this is Joanne Vassallo and I, I live in the county and I <clears throat> made some suggestions earlier about um, growth that is other than development because unfortunately, um, you know, we hear those two words as synonymous sometimes and they're not. So I just, um, so there is some work being done in what's called smart cities around the world and in the U.S., on what gives people a sense of community and um, what you're talking about in the bike paths and the pedestrian paths. 
is um, a big part of it. It's like one of six major um, recommendations for a sense of community in a town. So um, I just, uh, bravo. <laughs> Thank you, That's Joanne. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else online would like to make comment? Feel free to come off mute. Give us your name. All right. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Commissioner discussion deliberation. Sure. I'll say, um, I actually think that the street upgrades are pedestrian improvements. Mm -hmm. um, these neighborhoods, in large part, don't have sidewalks. And so where kids play, for better or worse, like when they're riding their bikes or riding skateboards or whatever, mm -hmm. is on the street. And so if it's not paved, they can't. I mean, they could ride their bike maybe, but maybe not if they're like just learning. It might be trickier. Um, but certainly they can't skateboard. You can't skate on those. No, uh, you can't skateboard on gravel. Well, neither oh. on the chip sealed roads. Oh, you can't? Mm -hmm. Okay. It sucks. Good information to know. Thanks, Commissioner Lyons. Well, you definitely can't do it when there's ruts that are yeah. like 8 to 12 inches deep either, which is what we had, I think, in Green Acres before. Um, so I actually think it is like some pedestrian improvement to have when there's roads and neighborhoods without sidewalks. Um, and thank you for educating me that you still can't skateboard. That's a bummer. Um, but at least you can ride a bike then more easily than a rutted road. So or push your baby carriage. Yeah, push your little stroller. Mm -hmm. You have to get special strollers if you're off roading. Yes. I actually should have one thing when I was mm -hmm. also walking through the Green Acres folks. Um, they were concerned about the amount of chip seal. Um, I'll say spoils that come off the sides of the road and coming into their yards and like, I don't know if there's a way to mitigate for that a little bit better or something. It just seemed like a bone to pick that there was a lot, a lot of the chip ceiling was coming off one of the sides of the road, mm -hmm. off of the, off of the road, excuse me, and onto the you know front yards of people's properties. And, and so they were concerned about a lot of that. Mm -hmm. That's what I was hearing. I appreciate the inputs. Um, I my so some of the some of the roads were permazined and chip sealed, and but some were we actually just applied gravel to those roads without the the additional permazine and the chip seal treatments. And so my understanding is, is some of that those gravel piles are from those roadways where we didn't actually adhere the chips, the gravel, yeah, that to the road be. surface. And so it, it has been pushed out over time and erosion and all that. So um, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Hopefully the permazine and the chip seal will hold it all together. Yeah. Yeah. I just have one more thing that I was going to say. I'm sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. Oh, just, well, well, let's do this. Mr. Willich, are you I have good? a mountain board, a gas-powered skateboard that'll go over the oh, oh. stuff just fine. And I'm done. Thank okay. <laughs> I just want to say, like, um, the Park Street, Park Street Crossing, I'm excited for that mm -hmm. um, because I've heard so many stories, not just from my children and also from other people, about where they've also almost been hit by cars, like, on the daily. Mm -hmm. It's a thing. Um, so that's a concern for all of us who walk on the north side. So I'm really excited that hopefully that'll make it feel safer and will actually make it safer. And Thank I'm, you. And, I'm, okay. and what I would also say is I'm excited about those rapid flashing beacons because also as a driver it's very hard to see people sometimes when they're walking out from behind a parked car so to have that flashing beacon is going to be so much better for for everyone and I feel like we've heard from people over the years for a long time that we need those flashing beacons so thank you for mm -hmm. Mr. Gator for following up on that and working with MDT to get us to that point because it is needed you know in the summertime those crossings get crazy and a lot of people and a lot of cars parked on either side of the road and so it should make it safer hopefully for everyone so thank you anything else all right it's tangential okay um but the kind of discussion of how 
road infrastructure can affect pedestrian safety. Mm -hmm. um, something that I've never heard us talk about on the commission or really any of the other boards that I'm aware of is traffic calming. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that traffic calming really is kind of best when it's when it's like citizen initiated when mm -hmm. folks folks are presenting a safety concern on their block or their neighborhood so um just kind of maybe from an administrative level um for you mr gager and however you want to direct your staff um if you're hearing safety concerns in neighborhoods that's something that i would be interested in um uh, because a lot of a lot of kind of the way the street network is designed in the old parts of Livingston um, kind of naturally slows down traffic, but there are parts of the community where that doesn't happen. Um, and where where traffic is not naturally slowed mm -hmm. and people are using active transportation, that's where there's some real safety issues. And so if we're here, if we're aware of or hearing about um, places where that might be a concern, that might be a, something to consider. And I, if I may, yes, and but, education around doing something like that. And again, in neighborhoods where people are concerned about that is really important. I don't know if, if any of you remember <laughs> but there was an attempt to try bump out um, at calendar and seventh, no, fifth, fifth, it was calendar and fifth, and it did not go over well. So, um, but I also, I think that there's a whole education around mm -hmm. it, what we're doing, why we need to do it, you know, places that people really want to see it, because I agree that traffic calming is, is the way to go, but we public engagement, public process, if we do that so it is successful would be my my thought on that. I was on the commission, if I may, may I? Mm -hmm. I was on the commission and we did use, there were those words, traffic calming measures actually. It had, it's been a minute, thank mm -hmm. you for bringing that up. Um, and I would say it was mixed. There were some people that actually really liked it mm -hmm. also um, because I- I can just tell you that the group that did it took a, it was, Yes, I remember. There was a lot of grace. I remember. For one um, person. I remember. And also there were people that liked it. Mm -hmm. And then there were people that were maybe borderline hostile mm -hmm. about it. Um, and there wasn't the greatest communication necessarily from certain stakeholders that were involved that could have like smoothed out mm -hmm. the process. Yeah. So um, I agree that if it's something that we talk about, it's great to know where the problem arises hearing from citizens. Mm -hmm. And then also figuring out, which is one of your skill sets, Mr. Gager, I think, is like bringing processes and conversations into public. Thank you. Um, makes it so much easier as a commissioner when people have the opportunity over and over to keep talking to city staff and the city commissioners. So I can imagine a world in which mm -hmm. I can imagine a city government in which it would be very different today if that happened versus how many years ago it was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just round that out by saying that um, safety for vulnerable road users is something that's super important to me. It's been a, a year and a half studying deaths of vulnerable road users in my postdoc. So um, it would be devastating for that to happen here. Um, and there are things we can do to try and abate the danger. So mm -hmm. it's a priority of mine. Maybe you can give us a presentation one of these days of public presentation on your research be happy to thank you commissioner Lines. anything else no, thank you well let's uh go ahead and vote roll call please chair kale four vice chair Nunes. four commissioner Lyons. four commissioner Lillich. four motion carried yay all right motion so begins i am going to make a motion um i'm going to make a motion to go into closed session Pursuant of state local infrastructure, oh, excuse me, pursuant to MCA 23203 to discuss the matter of individual privacy and 
pursuant to MCA 232034B to, to discuss litigation strategy. Second. Okay, so motion by Kale. Second by Newt. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so folks, we are going to go into closed session. Um, we will be back after the closed session for city manager comments and commissioner comments and to adjourn. Uh, we will put everybody on yeah, online into the waiting room and we'll bring you back afterwards. The transportation, the question transportation. Yes. Oh, yeah, really? that sounds like right. Designed and built a traffic comedy like that. Oh, I did not know. agenda. I just want to make sure that we're Um, uh, offensive stickers were placed on uh, both city and uh, private property. Uh, uh, and, and please know that uh, I apologize for the technical issues this evening. That's think we're so I am I am back and we are unneeded to go. The Commissioner Lyons need to go again. Do you want to restate your is he on the record or do you need him to go? Uh, it looks like I got kicked off towards the end of his comments. So do you want to say anything again or either? Good. Okay. I would just say I agree with what you said. And was it a proclamation or resolution? It was a proclamation. Yeah, it was a proclamation. Apologies. No, that's fine. Um, I still stand by that proclamation as well.
um, and have been helping to, to remove that hate speech. Um, and we will continue to be a city that rejects that um, and is welcoming to everyone. So thank you to the city staff and the city manager, my fellow commissioners and the citizens of Livingston. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. That. Um, so thank you to all of you and uh, thank you for a lively conversation this evening. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I have a motion by Lyon. So second. I'll second that. Second by Willich. I'll